Hello and welcome to Moni Mohsin, uh, the butterfly whom we've loved uh, and read for so many years. She's back with us, but she's back with the impeccable integrity of Ruby R, Ruby Roth to be precise. Um, it's again, one of those wicked, wicked satires on uh, everything that she sees around her. In this case, it's uh, Ruby, in uh, faced with a kind of charismatic leader who was once a popular film star, who could have been a popular cricket star. I mean, who could have been, uh, well, a lot of things. Moni, uh, uh, welcome and thank you so much for joining us from London, from plague-stricken London as <laughs> plague-stricken India, plague-stricken Pakistan. We're all in the same boat. Uh, how has it been for the butterfly? How has the butterfly taken to uh, COVID? Well, if it was a fictional butterfly, may I answer in butterfly's voice? Please. I yeah. love the little butterfly you have on your Insta. Uh, Thank you. So I'll channel her right now. So <laughs> you to know now that Janu's put me under house arrest ever since this COVID tamasha started, you know. I've been under house arrest only. You know, na ki ana, na jana, na utna, na bed, na, na lena, na dena, na koi coffee party, na koi khana, na koi ball, na koi shadi. I'm just stuck up at home only, you know. I've been stuck up there for I don't know how long now. And no bags to buy to show off to people. What will you do? You know, I've just been polishing all my bags and things. Not me, but I've made my Filipina, you know, she do it. She's, her name is Maria and she's from Vanilla. <laughs> and anyway, so she does all my sort of polishing and she's done it up. Jesse, I'm going to just put on my Prada bag and I'm going to rush out only. <laughs> to Oxford Street, of course, which is of course. Uh, the, okay, the stretch between Selfridges and John Lewis, which you say is like <laughs> Khan Market or Living. Like Khan Market of London, except that, you know, London is now under tier four. Yeah. So yesterday, you know, Christmas was cancelled. Day before yesterday, Christmas was cancelled. Everything is cancelled now. We don't, we don't, can't go out of the house. And a new kind of COVID strain has begun, which is much more infectious. Yeah. So even Boris Johnson is taking it seriously, which is saying something. <laughs> which is really saying something. You know, uh, Moni, uh, uh, I was talking uh, uh, recently to uh, someone, to Farid Zakaria, uh, as a mm. matter of fact. And he was telling me, uh, when you compare the rest of the leaders with Imran Khan. Uh, uh, actually, Imran Khan comes out smelling roses because he, by not doing anything, he's actually done a lot for Pakistan during COVID in the sense that uh, the death rate uh, or the infection rate has not been as high as it is in the rest of the world. Would you agree? I don't know why that has happened, you know. I really don't know why that has happened because, um, you know, in the beginning he was, he, he did go on television and say to everybody that aapne ghabrana nahi hai. You know, you have a flu. Hai. Aapko zukam lagega thodi dek ke liye thoda sa bukhar hoga, phir khatam ho jayega. Um, and and uh, I think, you know, but, but a lot of other leaders also did the same. I, I don't judge him for that. Uh, in the beginning, I think it caught everybody unaware. Um, but I think, uh, I don't know why the rates have been low in Pakistan. It's also, I think, because there's not so much travel to and from Pakistan. Right. right. You know, uh, so there's been less of it there. Uh, also, I don't know, because the population density is, is quite high. Um, there's another thing, but again, but that is like India, the population is young. Yeah. You know, right. and this is an illness which targets old people. Right. Uh, and in the West, etc., mainly, I mean, I think the average age in Italy of, of the people who have died, the mortality age from COVID is 83. Yes. You know, um, and it's in Sweden, I think it's taken a really high toll of people in care homes yeah. uh, and in Britain as well. Uh, so I think in that way, Pakistan has been lucky. But I mean, even compared to India, rates are good. I don't know why. Um, I don't know whether it's because Imran Khan has done something or not done something or whether everybody just says was a lucky shan, you know? I don't know what it is, but yeah, the rates have not been atrocious. So in the dim has done something right? Possibly. <laughs> but Possibly. I'm not going to go and say yes, yes or anything, you know? <laughs> let's talk about the uh, character in Ruby Rauf, uh, in, in uh, the impeccable integrity. Ruby Rauf. Uh, Ruby Rauf. Rauf. 
as in Khan, from yes. Lotus. We have our own Khan. Uh, but um, uh, talk a little about the character. Uh, obviously, so charismatic, former actor, wants to be uh, prime minister, wants to lead uh, uh, Pakistan out of its misery, uh, has his Rottweilers, has his media managers. Ruby becomes uh, his social media manager and becomes quite unlike what she uh, she is. Or, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, talk a little about uh, uh, this character, Sef, Sef and Sound, as you Sef. call him, as the hashtag is. Uh, uh, well, so I have to fit in. So, um, you know, it all began for me with the Harvey Weinstein story. Uh, you know, I remember watching it on television. It, it was kind of unfolding at that time. And, and he was making very um, rigorous um, uh, denials and saying, you know, this is all wrong. And, and his face, his immediate, his uh, um, legal team was fighting the case, etc. And I was watching the whole story unfold. And I was thinking to myself, if this happened in the subcontinent, how would it happen and where would it happen? What would be the setting? And, you know, like, I think part of the reason why it took such a hold on people's imagination was because it was in Hollywood. Um, and Hollywood is a, um, uh, you know, um, an area which is, which, which is sort of followed, the people are followed by, by the public. Uh, as I said, it has a very strong hold on people's imagination. And so, um, our film industry is not like that. You know, it was eviscerated under General Zia and it's kind of slowly recovering, but it hasn't got to, it's not like Bollywood is for you. So I was thinking, you know, where else could it be? And then I immediately thought of Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. And I thought it has to be in the political world. It has to be in the political sphere. And immediately, you know, the character of Bill Clinton, you know, sort of charming and dry, and, and sort of easygoing and all of that, um, that came to my mind. But then also I looked around, you know, to, to today's world and I looked at populist leaders. And I knew then that he had to be not just a democratic leader, he had to be a populist leader who was not from the world of politics, who would come from some other world, you know, and had pushed himself as somebody who, who had all the answers, the strong man that everybody's looking around for these days. Um, and so I... Um, gave him a, a, you know, I took a little bit from everywhere. <laughs> it was, it's a, like a, a little bit of an achar uh, safe and sound, I have to say. So a little bit of the mirch came from uh, Amitabh Bachchan's past, you know. I, know, as I was about to say it, the illness <laughs> that uh, you turned it into an accident here, right? <laughs> so <laughs> his, with, his back, with, the, with the background of the film star, you know. Uh, and how Amitabh Bachchan was, you know, it was a very strong character in the 1970s as, as a sort of warrior for social justice. And, you know, all those films like Diwar and and uh, what were the other ones which were kind of, you know, Amar Akbar, Antony, which That's, took a uh, Trishul, they were all him as this, uh, you know, someone fighting. Every young man yeah. fight, fighting for the rights of the ordinary person, you know. So I took a little bit of that because that has resonance in the subcontinent. People like that kind of thing. And I remember as a, you know, I was a young girl at that time and people would say things like, oh, yeah, if prime minister, hota na. even at that time, people used to say things like that. And um, then I took a little bit from, uh, a little bit from Boris Johnson, a little bit from Trump, you know, the reality star, uh, a little bit obviously from Imran Khan, the Tabdili, the Tabdili narrative, right. to, you know, and that we will change everything overnight and it'll be like a tsunami. Yeah. and everything will be transformed. You will wake up to a transformed Pakistan and three, three months corruption will be at an end. So I put them all together. You know, there's Bill Clinton, there is Boris Johnson, there's Putin without his shirt riding on that horse. You remember that? Yes, of course. Yeah, so there is that him as well. Um, and you know, all these guys with this kind of hyper-masculinity, this is sort of narrative of, of the cult hero, you know, who's going to come there and he's going to sort out everything by himself. Mm. Um, so that is what is behind Seth, really. And, um, uh, you know, Ruby being uh, such an intelligent and obviously hardworking young woman and very middle class. And I love the way you describe uh, 
you know how uh, teacups for her are uh, a measure of social anxiety rather than just uh, you know ordinary pieces of crockery i find that so excruciatingly real because mm. really in so many middle class homes especially those which have fallen on hard times i think mm. it really is like that it's a measure of uh, you know what you once were you yes know, and uh, where you hope to get back Exactly. Again. Hmm. So, uh, you know, Ruby is also quite uh, fascinating, isn't she? Because she could be uh, 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 one of the sisters, but she's not, you know, hmm. and, and I think she lets down a lot of her friends as well. And I find that quite fascinating because sometimes we are like that, aren't we? Um, please don't give away too much of the plot, yeah. but I... <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, I have to say that Ruby uh, reminds, you know, I have a lot of friends mm. uh, who I'm close to. And I thought that they, we were along this, you know, traveling along the same path, but suddenly they seem to have sort of <laughs> gone off on another side. And, and they are, they are, you know, they are great supporters of these sort of populist leaders. I have friends um, who also, I'm not my personal friend, but people that I meet who also like Trump a lot and seem to think that Trump has the answers for America and that he's a wise man, you know? Um, and, and so, and then with, with Imran Khan as well, I, I don't approve of his uh, government or his competence levels, et cetera, but I have friends who think he is, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the best thing since sliced bread. Um, and they think that he has all the answers. They think that he's doing a great job. They think that whatever he hasn't been able to do, it's because other people have stopped him or, you know, and that, uh, so, uh, you know, we do have people um, who until yesterday were friends of yours and now have become people who you do not see eye to eye with. Uh, and not because they themselves are wicked or because they are, uh, but it's just, it's a different way of looking at the world. Right. And uh, that's what somebody again said to me recently that Trump may have gone, but Trumpism is very much alive. Would yeah. you, you think that? Because uh, it does seem that uh, there's no let up to the wave of right wingers and populist leaders across the world. No, no, not so far. I hope that it will, I hope that COVID will, will test them to that degree that people will think eventually. You know, certainly Boris Johnson has lost a lot of support in the UK. Uh, his popularity is way down. Imran Khan is also, incidentally, right. uh, hasn't, you know, even though he's managed, uh, not he has managed, even though COVID has not uh, uh, affected Pakistan as badly as it has some other neighboring countries, but it uh, still, you know, there is rampant uh, inflation in Pakistan. Hmm. There is, uh, and people are screaming with, with, with agony. The people are not being able to cope. Um, and there is, you know, there are a whole lot of other issues which are, uh, which are um, in flow in Pakistan and have brought down his popularity hugely. I have friends who voted for him and said that, you know, he, usko chance dena you know, like it was a playground and everybody should get a chance on the, on, on, on the swings, you know, biski bari, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, he has lost a lot of support. I think Boris Johnson has lost support. I think even Trump has lost a whole lot of followers on Twitter. Um, not because, also, you know, there is a saying, particularly in the subcontinent and most particularly in the Punjab, you know, because Punjab has been the, the gateway for uh, invaders into India. The Punjabis have learned that, you know, always welcome to the new. That's quite fascinating, actually, you're right, you know. Mm -hmm. A big, uh, I mean, that's a that's become uh, second nature, perhaps. Yes, yes, and you you just jump onto the bandwagon, and when you see that that person is losing control, uh, losing the support, then it starts hemorrhaging support because other people also think, no, this is not the new thing. Right. You know. So I think a lot of people have left. Uh, I was reading an article about how Trump has lost about two hundred thousand followers on Twitter mm. ever since you know he's become a lame duck president mm. because people now feel that he's not going to become president again mm. and <laughs> of course he'll disagree with that uh, <laughs> violently or at least uh, uh, you know his uh, daughter and son-in-law will uh, yeah that, but he certainly that, has not been able to overturn these results right yeah, exactly he has tried his damnedest but he hasn't yeah 
So, um, how has uh, COVID been uh, in uh, in in uh, the UK, uh, Moni? How has it been, and uh, how has the butterfly dealt with it? How have you, as the butterfly, dealt with it in London? We know how she's dealt with it in Lahore. How has she dealt with it in London? You know, I, I'm speaking for myself. Um, I'm very fortunate, Kaveri. I have a roof over my head. I have food to eat. I have a job which I can do from home. I haven't lost my job. Um, and for all those reasons, um, I've been very fortunate in, in this time. Um, and, and, and also none of us, touch wood, mashallah, so far have, have had COVID. So uh, from all those, for all those reasons, uh, we've been fine. I have been fine. Uh, but it has been a testing time, you know, uh, because there was that very long lockdown in from March till June. And then they, um, and it was very uh, strict, not as strict, I have to say, though, as uh, in Italy or Spain or France, where you couldn't leave your house without getting permission um, from the government. Now, um, in, in Britain, we were allowed to go for a walk a day, um, and you could just step out of your home. Uh, but it's come back. And I think because Boris Johnson has not taken the decisions that he needed to take at the right time, he's always been behind the curve. And he I think he likes to be popular. And I think he doesn't like to take hard decisions. So he keeps on delaying it and delaying it until it becomes imperative. And then he does at the 24th hour. And then people get very upset because they're not given any uh, lead up. And he, you know, one day he's denying it. Like, I think Keir Starmer in the um, House of Commons the other day said that, you know, you need to have another lockdown. And he said, absolutely not, absolutely not, never. And then two days later, he said Christmas is canceled. So uh, people, you know, and I feel very bad for young people. Children, I think, have had a very hard time. Um, I think it must be the same in India, not uh, I know in Pakistan also they have suffered not being able to go to school, very important part of socialization, their socialization is now, um, you know, it, it, it's not available to them. My kids, my son was starting university, um, you know, he'd worked very hard to get into this particular university, he got there and then he, there was lockdown. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter has been learning online for the last year. She was supposed to be go abroad this year because they, she's learning a language and she was supposed to be in Tajikistan and Istanbul and all of that was canceled. So she's sitting in the next room now, <laughs> very upset. <laughs> so, um, so for all those reasons, uh, it's been difficult. Um, and a lot of my friends have had it. A lot of my friends have had COVID. Fortunately, uh, only one has been hospitalized, but yeah, it's it's been, been difficult and I think uh, socially it's for me it's been basically uh, I haven't been able to go home to see my parents as much as I would have liked to um, my parents are elderly and I try and go back about four or five times a year to see them this year I've only been able to go in October I was there in March uh, in late February and then up until October I couldn't go and then again for 10 days because there was another lockdown expected here so it's really just, uh, you know, completely transformed our lives, yet you, uh, you had time to reflect on it. And uh, I believe a new butterfly novel is expected. I would think the first COVID novel really uh, that I know of. Uh, could you talk a little about, about that? So it's not because I've been super productive. Uh, it's just because the time has come. You know, I write the butterfly as a diary still in the Friday Times. So it comes onto the back page of the Friday Times. Every three weeks, I write a diary. And in the other two weeks, my sister writes in the dim right. and she writes in the Fark Nama from Nawaz Sharif's point of view. So um, I was, so the diary is every three weeks. And so in the year I have, I think about 30 or so. And then I have, after six years, it's ready. So since the last one, I've have about six, seven years. And this time, so it's not a novel. It's just like the collection of columns, right. but. This one, the last year is going to be all about COVID uh, because she's been experiencing it in real time. Yeah. So it's going to be a COVID diary from her point of view about her life um, and how she's been keeping herself busy, what her thoughts have been in this time, how Pakistan has reacted, how her friends have reacted, how it's affected people um, uh, of uh, you know, her, her social milieu. 
What, what do you, you know, when you look at uh, Pakistan, uh, you know, uh, it will forever be hyphenated with India as well. Uh, what have you heard uh, from India about what's going on here? Uh, pretty much uh, the same kind of forces that are in Pakistan about, you know, uh, overthrowing the old elite and, you know, a new kind of uh, new India coming up like a Naya mm. Pakistan. I mean, you have the same kind of uh, churning mm. taking place here and a whole lot of social engineering as well, uh, the effects of which I think we will see uh, much later. But Pakistan has been through that uh, under General Zia. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, what do you hear of uh, uh, two neighbors who were once so close? Yeah, you know, that depresses me hugely. It, it really, really depresses me. We can't me. travel to each other. We can barely talk to each other. I, I mean, know. Uh, you know, we don't have to be the best of friends, but it's uh, we at least could talk to each other. We don't even do that anymore. You know, it causes me great anguish because I used to love coming to India. I used to love going to literary festivals in India, meeting people who were reading and writing. And in we India. love you. <laughs> oh, thank you. You know, and I miss it so much. I mean, this I can just about bear because in India. Oh, you know, I, I so wish that we could have uh, an open border. I so wish that we could just travel back and forth. And I do believe that if ordinary people could have more contact with each other, you know, a lot of the misconceptions that we have would also be uh, uh, laid to rest. Having said that, obviously there are, um, you know, there are uh, um, power blocks in both countries who would like to see them, you know, both both countries separated. Um, you were saying that Pakistan has changed and that Pakistan there has been there's been ferment, etc. But in Pakistan, the same people who were in power before are in power now. General Musharraf's cabinet bears an uncanny resemblance to, uh, to Imran Khan's cabinet. So not much has changed. It is just the, 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 you know, the face has changed. Uh, but, but the power structures behind it, behind it, certainly in Pakistan, it's the same. Um, well, uh, I don't know whether you can say the same about India, but, you know, let's go back a little to uh, uh, Saif, uh, our Saif Haq. Uh, quite uh, uh, stupid but charismatic uh, leader. Uh, talk a little about more, uh, talk a little more about his Rottweilers. Uh, they again bear an uncanny resemblance to the women around uh, a certain Im the Dim, right? <laughs> they had well, a similar you know, name, didn't they, Moni? Sorry? They had a similar name, didn't they? The Rottweilers. <laughs> I don't know about them, but you know, Kavri, the one thing that really upsets me about uh, PTI, certainly Imran Khan's party, is that they have coarsened the public discourse to a great deal. And the trolls, uh, uh, they are trolls for uh, Nawashi's party as well, but <clears throat> uh, you know, PMLN uh, and for PPP, I'm sure. But the PTI trolls are the worst. Um, and uh, trolling has now become a, uh, a, a form of, of uh, harassment, which is now accepted widely, you know, um, and it is, but it is nonetheless extremely um, distasteful um, and extremely sort of, if not physically, then, you know, emo emotionally, there's emotional violence in there and there's abuse. Um, and it is something for which I really cannot forgive them. Um, it is vile and it is awful and it's particularly bad as far as women are concerned. You know, recently, um, both, um, and you know, what you start then comes back, you know, what goes around comes around. Uh, so recently there was this, um, uh, Maryam Nawaz had been leading these uh, um, anti-government protests. I don't know if you've heard about them, but you know, she's been addressing very big crowds in Pakistan in all four provinces. Um, and recently after the, the before the one in lahore there was this you know a hashtag going around about about mariam nawaz's sort of you know calling equating her with a prostitute and then nawaz she, them them responding with with uh, um, um, pinky pirni being called uh, imran khan's wife being called a prostitute you know so so using women in that way and it's it's appalling and awful and i can't um, I, I really cannot bear it. And I feel that it has been 
normalized in both India and Pakistan. So that, and also this giving of, of awarding of certificates of, uh, uh, of uh, treachery, uh, you know, that uh, such and such is a traitor and such and such is a traitor and pack up your bags and go to the, to the neighboring country. You know, you are forever packing and unpacking here, you know, <laughs> it's just. Yeah, I mean, in, in India, it's a common form of abuse, you know, please pack yeah. your bags and go back to Pakistan. Uh, yeah. and uh, Shah Rukh Khan once said to me, why can't they send me to a, a country which is better uh, uh, climate at least? Yeah, why not send me to Iceland if you must send me somewhere, you know? Why oh, Pakistan? I but know. Uh, is, is, that, is that what is uh, told to uh, people in uh, Pakistan uh, to go to India? Uh, well, you know, the difference is that uh, I think in India it is used for against Muslims, yes. right? So if there's a Muslim who says it, then obviously he must be a, 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 a Pakistani, Pakistani yeah, mm -hmm. or Pakistani spy. In India, you're a Mus in Pakistan, you're a Muslim, so going to India for that reason would not be a sort of, it right. is because you're a spy, yeah. oh, you're right. an Indian agent. Uh, you know? okay. So that's why you should pack up. And you're not told to pack up your bags and go to India, just pack up your bags and leave, get out of this country. Okay. So even if you criticize anything, you know, even <clears throat> if you sort of, or you have dissent, Right. Or you have dis or you have a disagreement. You say I don't agree with. It. Well, pack up your bags and leave there if you don't like this country. Mm -hmm. Go to the west. You know, go go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. But you're not allowed to stay here. You're not allowed to stay here, and you're not allowed to speak your mind. Mm -hmm. That is the thing. So how does Butterfly manage? She still says so much. And how do you manage? You have to be careful. Is there a lot of self censorship? There's a lot happening in India. I can tell you. Is it happening there? Yes, there is self-censorship, but you know, we've always known what we can't speak about yeah. and what is. Um, but uh, I think humor helps, English helps. I think it's much worse if it is in Urdu because then it's, your outreach is much greater. Right. Um, and uh, if you are sort of, and satire helps because satire you can, you know, sort of gold mold, <laughs> you can give a lot of things. Right. Uh, so for all those reasons. I, I, I was, and generally butterflies is sort of more good humored. Hmm. She's affectionate. It's a kind of affectionate uh, take. I mean, obviously there is that sharp edge to it as well, but by and large, and also because she makes fun of herself and her own class. Hmm. And so that's all right. So she's not making so much fun. You know, it would be awful if I was making fun of people um, of other classes and not myself. That's right. She's not a snob. I mean, she's she is. She's a raging snob. <laughs> she's a snob, but she's she's a good-natured snob. How do you put it? I mean, she's not she's not an evil snob. She's not evil, and she's so stupid that you feel sorry for her. You know, <laughs> so you like her. <laughs> I suppose because yeah, she's really dim. And she is, and she is loyal. Yeah, she is loyal. Right to Janu and to Pakistan, I think. And to Pakistan and to her, you know, at the end of the day, I don't know if you've read Tender Hooks. Yeah. But right. at the end of the day, she protects her friends. Right. You right. know, when her friend is faced with, with pain and difficulty, yeah. she, she, and she fights that, you know, she fights. Uh, for them, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, in fact, um, yeah, we can't talk too much about uh, Ruby's friends, but her friends are very interesting as well. You want to talk a little about Farah, especially whom I really liked. I thought she had, yeah. she had so much of the integrity that is supposed yeah. to be the uh, part yeah. that Ruby goes to, doesn't she? She's really the conscience of... Uh, yes, she's the moral compass of the book. Yeah. Isn't really. it? Yeah. 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 In her best, the moral yeah. compass. Yeah. Is talk a little about her. She's quite uh, extraordinary. So, you know, there are a lot of Pakistani women like that, particularly in the media, you know, strong, brave, outspoken women who uh, tell it like it is and receive a lot of abuse and receive a lot of, of censure, but they keep at it. And um, I'm deeply, deeply impressed by them. And, and, and Farah, in a way, is a tribute to them yeah. and to their resilience and to their courage. Right. Truly, you know, we have some uh, uh, some of them here as well. And I think we really do owe a lot to them because otherwise the level of misogyny and hate that uh, exists for women who speak their minds 
is amazing. We are united in that, I think. Both yes, things. yes. And I think, you know, A, there is, there is any way there is trolling. But yeah. to, as you say, against women, it's also misogynistic trolling, you yeah. know, which has a different, and there's kind of sexual uh, uh, violence is threatened. Yeah. I mean, awful. everybody is threatened with rape or, you yes. know. Uh, Acid throwing or, or, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, it's really quite terrible. So, you know, I mean, when you look at all that, when you read all that, when you listen to those stories and yet to uh, sort of, uh, you know, uh, look at it with humor, must be taking a lot of, uh, a, 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 I think a lot out of you, doesn't it? Um, Kavri, you know, people have different personalities and I, I have, uh, I, sometimes I get quite down, but I have to say that when I think about the world and when I think about COVID, my husband is a very, very optimistic person, you know, and I keep saying to him, why are you so optimistic? But <laughs> uh, I am, that he's a bit like Janu. He is a bit like Janu. He's a very sort of, uh, again, very strong moral compass and very sort of optimistic and educated and sort of enlightened view of the world. And I'm a Punju sort of constantly sort of saying, <laughs> but he, um, I was, uh, um, sorry, we were talking about finding humor in such finding a human situation. Yeah. Um, I, but having said that, at the end of the day, you know, I have to laugh. I have a very strong sense of the ridiculous. And wherever I go, I just see things and I just keep, you know, keep laughing at things. And so that is my way of communicating with the world, with myself, with my children, with my husband, with everybody. And it comes out in my writing. I cannot not write like that because that's the way I am. I wonder how your children, uh, who are clearly teenagers, take to this humor. Do they sometimes get irritated? <laughs> uh, you know, being a teenager is not a very funny thing these days. Well, luckily, my daughter is now 22. <laughs> My son, though, is 19, but he, and they keep saying, oh, for God's sake, Amos, you exaggerate so much. Can't, can't you just tell a story like it is? But then, but then but they also say, <laughs> and that didn't happen like that. Why are you making it up? Because you have to make up stories, you know, otherwise everything is so boring. Absolutely. <laughs> I love the way, uh, you know, uh, Ruby organizes the social media and she says, okay, these cute uh, children with uh, chubby cheeks and not the ones uh, who would, uh, you know, sell their <laughs> grandmothers <laughs> the drugs. You know, the kind of picture perfect Insta posts that she talks about and the Twitter hashtag. And that we keep saying, seeing everywhere. I mean, every, everybody's life is so fabulous under COVID, you know. <laughs> I'm, I'm astonished. Where are these people living? Who are they? I want to know them. <laughs> and cooking such fabulous food. Yes, I know. All this yeah. freshly baked bread and all these beautiful flowers and, you know, these gorgeous clothes and, you know. Where are they going? What are they doing? <laughs> Who are they meeting? Uh, picture perfect families back on the dining table. We're all so cozy together. Surely life can't be as wonderful as. Uh, oh, mine certainly isn't. <laughs> really, what is what are our lives now? And do you feel that it's something that um, is a permanent change, or are we just going to go back to all our in butterflies' case, uh, uh, you know, LV the handbag and the showing yeah. all that? Are we going to go back to all that, or has it changed us fundamentally? You were talking a little earlier about the Spanish flu and how there wasn't enough literature on yeah. that. Can you talk a little yeah. about that as well. Perhaps it's connected. So so, you know, I was talking, I was, uh, I had uh, participated in a webinar uh, last week and <clears throat> there were these two um, uh, professors of English literature and I don't know why I was invited. I was the third person in the <laughs> and they were both- Marvelous way you use the language. <laughs> no, I think, and they were also quite shocked because they presented papers and I didn't know it was a, I had to present a paper. So I was just thought it would be like this, you know, but Sheet. Um, but, <laughs> but I, um, but, but one of the professors there said that in the beginning of the, of the last century, there were two huge upheavals. One was the First World War, obviously, and the second was the Spanish flu. And the First World War, there was so much literature, there was so much poetry, there were so many books, there was so much art which came out of it, there was even music which came out of it, um, and nothing came out of the Spanish flu. Nobody wrote about it and far more, 
uh, many more people died of the Spanish flu and all around the world, not just in Europe, but all around the world, even in India, you know, millions of people died. Um, so I think about 20 million people died altogether. And yet there's nothing in, in our writing. And why is that? And I think part of the reason may be because I think nobody has an explanation for illness, where it comes from, why it came, how it went. And we, we do, still don't know why it died out. Yeah. It did finish, right? Within the space of four or five years, it had finished. Right. And right. why it had finished, why it had come. And also because up, up until that time, now war is different. Yeah. But up until that time, uh, you know, if there was a battle, only combatants were really killed unless your country was taken over. Right. In this case, it comes into your home. You know, the illness comes to your home. It takes your parents away. It can kill your children. And that is the sort of the nightmare of all parents, you know. And, and the uh, Spanish flu was different to COVID in that young people died. Uh, not old people. It, mm. it affected mainly younger people. So um, it is, I think it, these things do change people. In our case, I think it has changed us in that we have realized uh, some things, certainly for myself, um, I don't want to consume so much yeah. anymore. You know, I do feel that, you know, the, the, the climate change and, and, and COVID together uh, have made me feel that we, I certainly have to cut down on my consumption. My children, uh, my daughter in particular, uh, is uh, very um, serious about it. She's become a vegetarian. She doesn't buy new things. Uh, she uh, has also forced me to change my point of view. And, you know, we haven't been able to travel during COVID. Um, and some of it was, you know, I, I miss, I mean, I miss all of it. But the thing which I really, I regret is not being able to see my parents. Everything else I've now decided that if I'm Going to travel i'm not going to go for 10 days to america if i go on a holiday now i'm going to go for well, i'll take one holiday and go for a long period of time mm. so that you know i cut down on all this useless air travel and now you know you and i are talking like this uh, we have realized that we can do these things that all that business travel that people used to do for two yeah. days and three days is unnecessary right um so much of this is unnecessary yeah you know um i certainly have not missed buying clothes I really haven't. Mm. The only thing I need now are bigger trousers. But other than that, <laughs> I haven't really <laughs> missed yeah. anything. We just uh, need to look good up until here. And now uh, that <laughs> Michi, I'm wearing, I'm wearing a chappal, you know, Hawaii chappal underneath, a plastic chappal. Um, but uh, also, uh, what I have missed are friends. I've yeah. missed company of friends. I've missed seeing people. I've missed coming to the festival because I want to meet people, not because I want to, uh, you know, uh, be in a new place, mm. uh, but because I want to make new friends. I want to see people. I want to engage again. But Muni, you've done a lot of that uh, on, on Zoom as well. I've seen some of the chats you've done and they've really been lovely, you know, with, uh, I think, Meera Sethi, your niece, uh, yeah. with Camilla, a lot of interesting uh, uh, conversations you've had with uh, uh, these writers and authors. What what has that uh, taught you? Uh, you know those kinds of conversations which you've kept going and done really quite remarkably well. How has that? Uh, uh, how how have those been? I've I've really enjoyed them yeah. because I couldn't meet people and I thought to myself, you know, actually my daughter insisted that I do them because I don't know anything about social media. She's the one who sort of, you know, tells me, you've got to do this, you've got to do that. Come on, come on, come on. And so she started me on this. And in the beginning, I thought I should just talk to writers. Um, but over time, it's sort of become broader. I did, uh, I don't know if you ever got to see this uh, TV serial called Chodales, which was um, based in... Fabulous. And <laughs> interviewed, you interviewed uh, them, right? Yes, I, I interviewed Nimra Bucha, who was one of the Chodales. Um, <laughs> so we called it a, a conversation between two Chodales, <laughs> uh, <laughs> which was lovely. And, and I got to me and I got to talk to Shobha Day. I got to talk to Diksha Basu. I got to talk to Mahesh Rao. Um, and I hope to, you know, and, and also a lot of other Pakistani friends. Um, I got to talk to William Dalrymple, and I hope very much that um, I will, you know, uh, be able to do more. Um, I hope to do uh, Shazia Sikandar next, and an up-and-coming young Pakistani writer called um, uh, Rania uh, Ahmed. 
uh, who is brilliant. Okay. What is what has she written? Have you read it? So she took part in a, um, a, um, a competition uh -huh. uh, called the Zenith Harun Literary Prize. It's a short story prize. Okay. Uh, either an essay or a short story you can submit. She right. submitted an essay, right. uh, and it and it's a, only open to women in Pakistan uh, of Pakistani origin. Right. And she wrote a brilliant essay about what it means to be a woman in Pakistan and to occupy public space. Right. How the minute you enter a room, you hunch your shoulders, you adjust your shirt, you pull up your collar, you straighten your, you know, and how you occupy a small space. Yeah. Right. And how you are in the only time she says that she feels entirely free in Pakistan is when she goes to go swim at um, a public swimming pool where, where it has uh, ladies hours. <laughs> and that's the only time when she feels that she's not being watched wow. and judged, you know? She may as well be speaking for women in India. In it's India. it's exactly. the same. Same. The and male gaze follows us everywhere. Absolutely. And, and it has and it's possibly become worse during COVID. You know, I, I find that uh, uh, because uh, women are not being able to go out into the public as much, you know, the whole idea of loitering for the sake of loitering with so many yeah. women in India have talked about, feminists in India have talked about, that itself is stopped because now every public outing has is supposed to have a purpose, you know. Yes, yes. Uh, that's why I think one of the most surprising things uh, that we saw during uh, the lockdown was these hordes of, um, uh, okay, the writer's name is Rania Hussain. Rania Hussain, not Rania. The father's name is Ahmed Hussain. Right. So, uh, sorry. So, uh, you know, the uh, what surprised a lot of people was, uh, as if they didn't know, was that so many of the migrants are women because they are the ones who build your cities, they work in your homes, they're the invisibles to us. And, you know, suddenly they were visible to us uh, in these hordes of people uh, trying to go back home. So isn't it odd to you that yet we have to fight for our space uh, in the public domain? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. You know, um, there is unfortunately this belief that, um, you know, I did, a, I did an article, a long article on uh, women who go to work in Saudi Arabia. Mm. And um, <clears throat> that was the, quite extraordinary experience. I wonder what it was like, yeah. So Indonesian women, you know, Muslim women who go to work in, in Saudi Arabia. And a lot of them said that because Saudi men in, in Saudi society, they don't allow their women out, right, out of the home. And there are very few jobs available to them and basically as teachers and in girls' schools and things. Um, and so uh, women who do come out of their country to come and work in their homes, they, they consider them uh, as, as loose women um, and fair game, therefore, you know. And I think a little bit of that thinking exists in the subcontinent as well. Mm -hmm. So that if a woman leaves her, you know, char diwari and yeah. steps out of it, then she's asking for trouble. Yeah. Whenever there's a rape case, for instance, yeah. You know, the first thing that is asked, why are you coming out? Why are you coming out at that time? Why are you coming out at that time? Why are you coming out at that time? You know, as if it is, uh, you know, she is only safe in her own home. Right. And the minute she steps out, she is fair game. You know, uh, and I think that feeling in this, uh, during COVID, um, must have been exacerbated because everything, you know, all our feelings have been exacerbated in this time. Uh, you know, just uh, you talked about Chudels and it just, I was just thinking, of course, this has been discussed uh, many times before, but uh, you know, the, the quality of television in Pakistan versus the quality of cinema, especially when you talk about uh, our friend, uh, Seth, uh, you know, being a movie star and, uh, doing these fabulous things on screen. Why is Pakistani television so, so cool? And why is Pakistani cinema so, so bad? I mean, ex with a few exceptions. Um, you know, Kaveri, during the time of General Zia, uh, Pakistani cinema was dealt a death blow. Um, so he closed down a whole lot of cinemas. He raised taxes on film tickets. Um, he made it uh, absolutely sort of economically impossible for them to continue. Uh, 
Mm. Uh, a lot of cinemas of my childhood, you know, these lovely old art deco places where I used to go to see things like Cleopatra and the Yellow Rolls Royce and Ryan's Daughter and stuff like that. And also a lot of in Pakistani movies like Aina. Mm. Um, those were um, um, uh, those were turned into um, uh, shopping malls, mm. you know, because um, <clears throat> they could no longer exist financially. Mm. It's only now that cinema is slowly kind of limping back into um, uh, into uh, a sort of existence again. Um, and the kind of films that have been made recently have been fantastic, mm. um, but they are you know more like art films, less commercial, but still very interesting films. Pakistani television um, has had a pretty straightforward run, so you know it has had a lot of. Uh, good um, uh, serials, etc. Um, good television, but I, you know now I think, in fact, um, Indian plays almost better in the sense that Pakistani plays. A lot of them now are about. Having said that, in the seventies they were brilliant. In the eighties they were brilliant. They were really anti-establishment and they were outspoken and uh, uh, clever, uh, courageous. Now they are uh, about you know the. They're misogynistic, unfortunately. Mm. Um, a lot of them are written by these really misogynistic men. Um, they're about a woman who is uh, the, the, the bahu of the house, mm. who, who is maltreated. Um, she is uh, submissive. Uh, she cries all the time and uh, puts up with whatever shit everybody throws at her. And eventually one day they feel sorry for her and remember, realize that she's actually uh, a saint amongst themselves. And, and then they they um, they forgive her. <laughs> and, uh, so I mean I'm not particularly impressed by those. But having said that, Churels was just such a departure from that. It was so amazing. Women with agency. Um, we love it in India as well. I'm so glad things are still at least you know borders may be closed, but people are still traveling to each other. Yes. Each other's yes. yes. I am addicted to Mirzapur. Right. I'm addicted to Mirzapur at the moment, you know, and <laughs> well, I have to say. <laughs> so is half of India. <laughs> and and the, 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 um, the portrayal of women yes. in, in, you know, they are so interesting, they are nuanced, they yeah. have agency, they have, uh, you know, and they're different kinds of women. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're not all the same, like, like uh, Kaleen Bhai's wife, yeah. Bina. Oh, I love her, Bina. <laughs> she is, she's such an operator. And then <laughs> the, the daughter-in-law, Munna's wife, yeah. uh, you know, she, and, and then Golu, and then Dimpi, everybody has, you know. You, you obviously are following it very closely. Very, I love it. I absolutely love it. It's fantastic. Right. And I loved Made in Heaven as well. Yeah, oh yeah. It. Can't uh, wait I, for the second series. Yeah, I think there was so much. Um, they said so much, and yet uh, it was done in such a subtle way. You know, it was just Absolutely. fabulous. Um, uh, and of course, it was a certain class that I think uh, we could uh, perhaps identify with as well. No, but you know, it was there were many classes. So jazz in, in Made in Heaven was not from yeah. the same class as, as yeah. that, you know. Uh, and even the, the female protagonist is not from the same class. Hmm. That is her problem, right? Fact, that is the issue there. That is the issue. Yeah. And, and also, uh, you know, some of the, um, there's that harassment case, that yeah. young girl, you know, and she, she's not a victim either. No. You know? yeah. so, <laughs> so everybody is very interesting. And what I like about, um, about Made in Heaven is the truth telling. Yeah. You recognize it, you see it, you recognize it, and therefore you like it and you enjoy it even more because you, you know that this is something that you, it's also familiar. Yeah. Muni, has uh, Butterfly never wanted to be uh, on uh, TV or in uh, the movie theaters? Butterfly has been desperate to be in movies and in television theaters. If you want to find someone who Butterfly, I would be your slave forever. <laughs> but that is one thing I think which is not yet permitted between India and Pakistan. Uh, um, Amazon will not take Pakistani content. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's uh, something mm. has to be done about this, no? I believe so. I think so because I think we have a lot to say to each other. You know? 
Yeah, and, and I I have, you know, tons of Pakistanis love Mitsapur. I don't know if you saw, I tweeted about it the other day and I got back so many responses, all of them saying, I love it too. It's a, you know, I think it's the game of thrones of, of India. Yeah. So butterfly ko at least, wo kya karenge? Usko Delhi mein base kar denge. And they'll say, ha, theek hai. Lahore mein nahi hai. She's in Delhi. Ja bhi kar le usko. Don't put her in Delhi. That's fine. But the thing is that her... Uh, her edge comes from the fact that she lives in this environment where there is particular kind of suppression, hmm. you know, and a particular you know, kind getting there. Hum aap, <laughs> we're, we're coming to, you know, your level, not to worry. So, uh, so when you look around, Moni, are things, are, uh, are you like your husband, optimistic, or are you, you know, wondering where do we, how, how much worse can it get before it gets better? You know, um, Kaveri, I think we have no choice but to be friends at the end of the day. You know, yeah. our challenges are so huge. You know, we are faced with this environmental catastrophe. And if you inhale the air of Delhi and you inhale the air of Lahore, there's very little difference. It's equally toxic. You know, our rivers are melting. Our rivers are drying up. Our, our, our glaciers are melting. Yeah. Uh, if COVID has taught us anything in this time. It has taught us that, you know, our fates are linked mm. and uh, there's nothing we can do about that. So you might as well just get along with each other. And there are so many dangers that we are faced with in any case. Mm. Why, why exacerbate them, you know? Um, just try and, you know, and, and also certainly in Pakistan's case, we have been spending far, far too much on defense and far too little on health. You know? sure. I mean, look at us. We're supposed to be, uh, you know, spending 6% on education. We've not come anywhere close to that. Our 6% would be a dream, but anyway. Uh, but, but, you know, at the end of the day, you can have your huge, uh, you know, uh, atomic arsenals. They're not going to protect you from, from COVID. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and the number of people who have died you know, what have I, you know, it, it's, they haven't died because of a war. Exactly. They have died because of poor health, uh, health infrastructure at the end of the day. So, um, Moni, at the end of the day, all I have to say is that Ruby Roff, but if, never mind Butterfly, let's start a campaign to make Ruby Roff uh, our next uh, uh, movie star or streaming star. She has to have a series dedicated to her. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I'd rather I'd like to have Farah have a series dedicated to her. Ah, Farah, Farah Mujahid. <laughs> Farah Mujahid, then uh, yeah, Farah can be the uh, can be the constant uh, star, and she can have episodes. I think you need to start a new series with Farah. She's Thank you. Cool. And I <laughs> love the way she tips her ash into anything that she can find. <laughs> <laughs> we'll play her, Moni. Who will play her? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. It has to be someone I, stylish. In India uh, or in Pakistan? India, may I would like Twinkle Khanna to play her. Uh, superb. <laughs> she has to be persuaded to come out of retirement for this. Yeah. She'd be perfect. And Pakistan, may? Pakistan, may I would love Meera Sethi to play her. Ah, lovely. <laughs> a little bit of nepotism, of course. TK. Of course. <laughs> That's in our blood. <laughs> That's in our blood. And she is my beloved, beloved niece. So, itna to mein kar sakti uske liye. <laughs> Thank you so much, Moni Mohsin. It was such a pleasure to talk to you. And more power to Farah, to Butterfly, to Ruby, to all the women uh, that you dream of. Uh, thank, thank you so you. much. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.